Thank you again uh, for coming to uh, the Forum today. Uh, and yet, uh, most of you are not new the first time here. So thank you again for coming. Uh, maybe a few people first time coming to the uh, Forum this semester. Today we have uh, again another great speaker for our series. Speaker series. And here let me uh, read his bio. You see, uh, Dr. Fred McGee. Dr. Fred McGee is an urban and environmental anthropologist who has written about and organized intensely in public housing projects in Europe, America, and the Pacific Islands. As the last my part fellow at UT Austin, he helped to create the university's undergrad degree programs in urban studies, as well as his doc uh, doctoral portfolio. An adjunct associate professor of anthropology at Austin Community College, Dr. McGee formerly served on Austin's Community Development Commission and the Joint Sustainability Committee. He has been active in the private sector as a consulting archaeologist and a historian since 2002. Dr. McGee is the author of four books and was a candidate for the Austin City Council. 2014. So here, uh, looking at the first slide, he is a private consultant, a writer, now public speaker. So welcome, Dr. Mandy. Hey, Greg, can you hear me all right? I'm good. Hi, everybody. I see a lot of faces. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourselves? How about you, sir? <laughs> got a bite, Greg. You got a bite, I know. I'll put you on the spot. You did. Um, I'm Kyle. I'm a community and regional planning master's student. Huh. originally from California. Ah. Ah. Uh, how about you, man, back there, all the way at the end? Yes, you. Me? Nope. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. You know, before coming here and working up this talk, I was trying to figure out whether I should show up and be professorial uh, or be a member of the community. I'm delighted to see that my friend and colleague and uh, a former speaker, Susana Almanza of Poder, is uh, in the audience today. And uh, I'm very, very glad uh, that she's here, much to my surprise. So what I'll do is I'm going to plow through. I'll give you some slides. I do have some slides just to kind of whet the appetite. But what I would like to do is to have some sort of Socratic dialogue. I am going to be professing a point of view about new urbanism that is based upon my decades of experience in public housing all over the world, from Kuhiu Park Terrace in Honolulu to Gropiusstadt in Berlin to the Weissenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart, to the housing projects that you see in my first slide. Uh, and you might have heard of me here in Austin, Texas, as the guy who is the founder and leader of Preserve Rosewood, the coalition to preserve Austin's Rosewood Court's public housing project, indeed all of our historic public housing. Okay? So having set the stage, let me get right into it. Okay? Anybody seen any of these housing projects before? These, these are obviously before they were demolished. Anybody familiar with them? We all know. Well, let me guess. Let me ask you. What do you know about public housing? What is it? Come on. Y'all ain't learning nothing about public housing around here? You mean United States or per country? Uh, that's kind of true, yeah. Yes, sir. Like in one sentence, public housing is uh, housing actually constructed by public, rather than like like low income housing that is built for uh, voucher recipients or housing built by uh, nonprofits or low income housing private developers. Sort of true, but not really. Okay. Okay. 
public housing has all in the United States has always been privately constructed, including our public housing here in, the, uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, matter of fact, when the housing program began in 1937, it wasn't just seen as an opportunity to house families of low income, right? It was also seen during the Great Depression as an economic benefit. In other words, as a spur to the real estate construction industry. And indeed, much of what we know about modern urban planning, community and regional planning, comes from this era. It's something that I've tried to make very plain in my nominations of these housing projects to the National Register of Historic Places. Much of what we take for granted in the profession of planning today is an outgrowth of the New Deal. And let me get into some of that uh, here in a minute. I guess I can't use my clicker, so I guess I just have to do this. I have to slide, I have to stand over here at the podium. I can't, you know, normally I want to walk around. Now, new urbanism is a lot of things. You probably know more about new urbanism than I do in some ways. I mean, you guys are going to be planners, I presume, right? So let me just quote one of the leading new urbanists out there, Andres Duani, uh, and furnish you a quote by him in 2001 about, which I think illustrates what new urbanism does and what its conceptualizations actually entail. You're, probably, you're not going to need me to read this to you, but I think you get the point, okay? New urbanists if Dwani is any indication, and Dwani is not, only the, the, not the only member of the Congress for the New Urbanism who holds this perspective, Peter Calthorpe and others pretty much agree that this is also uh, the way to go. What Dwani basically is saying here is, is gentrification is a good thing. Okay? And in other words, our job as planners is to create policies to address disinvestment that has been part of uh, urban America over the years. And one of the ways you do that is by deliberately gentrifying neighborhoods. Gentrification, according to him, is usually good news, for there's nothing more unhealthy for a city than a monoculture of poverty. This is how these people see urban America, and increasingly, urban areas around the world. It would stand to reason with a perspective of this nature that they would target public housing for some of their first experimentation in terms of uh, enacting some of these beliefs. So what that then entailed, over time, throughout the 1990s in particular, was a vilification of public housing. So you hear it described as isolated, dangerous, oppressive, bleak and battered, synonymous with gangs, drugs, misery, and murder, hell holes of gunshots, drugs, crime, and stench. <laughs> Henry Cisneros, the former secretary of the Housing and Urban Development Department, who is the editor of this book, published in 2009, From Despair to Hope. Mr. Cisneros, who's also the former uh, mayor of San Antonio, uh, is a big believer in this notion of defensible space. But in 1995, he called public housing as close to the approaches of hell as one can find in America. <coughs> former Vice President Al Gore called the monuments of hopelessness. And then just to cut right down to the chase in 1996, when Bob Dole and his running mate, former HUD Secretary Jack Kemp, were running against Bill Clinton, they called public housing, as, they called it one of the last bastions of socialism in the world. Okay? So in the United States in particular, where we have already a built-in predisposition to dislike publicly financed and publicly controlled uh, public goods or parts of the commons, whether that be health care, whether that be education, whether that be environmental protection, uh, certainly public housing, because it's real estate, 
sits out there like a sitting duck. So how do we get to this? Well, let's take as an uh, entry road into this uh, two mission statements that really also talk about what has happened to public housing authorities in terms of their mission as new urbanism has deepened its clutches into how we conceive of how development in cities like Austin, Texas takes place. The original mission statement from 1939 of the Austin Housing Authority is to furnish safe, decent, and affordable housing for families of low income. Very simple, very direct, pretty much straightforward, and that is indeed what it did. Austin, Texas has the oldest USHA, United States Housing Authority, public housing in America. Santa Rita Courts, 40 units built for quote unquote Mexican families. Rosewood Courts, 86 units built for African American families. And Chalmers Courts, recently decided to become part of the Plaza Saltillo Todd, built for white families, 60 units. Okay, actually it's reversed. Um, Rosewood was 60 units and Chalmers was 86 units. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that Austin, Texas has the oldest public housing in America. You should go visit it sometime before it goes away, okay? Uh, Susanna and I and other members of the community are fighting to preserve it, but I think uh, our city's leaders have a different perspective. <laughs> and it's embodied in the Housing Authority's 2017 mission statement, which states, to cultivate sustainable, affordable housing communities and partnerships that inspire self-reliance, growth, and optimism. Notice how much more slimy that definition is. How it's much more resistant to empirical quantitative analysis. Notice how it's much more about feelings. And notice how much more difficult it is to hold these people or this organization accountable. I mean, how do you measure whether somebody is feeling more optimistic? Think about I me. Mean, how do I measure that? Oh, I, feel, I just feel so much more optimistic today. I mean, it's very interesting. But that's a really good example of how neoliberalism and new urbanism operate. Now, the intellectual foundations of all of this, I think, are very interesting. And I just wanted to put this slide up here to give you some idea about what was done to public housing in terms of the vilifications that you saw earlier. And it has to do with conceptualizations of history, okay? So, you probably are familiar with some of the controversies here about Confederate monuments, right? One of the things that I constantly hear from people is, is oh, you're being, you know, McGee, you're being, you're being presentist. What does presentism mean? It's this notion that you cannot use the standards of today and apply them to the past. Well, Jefferson Davis, I mean, he actually was anti-slavery. Was he? Of course he wasn't, but a lot of people are like, well, then you at least have the obligation to see his world as he saw it. You can't use the standards, the moral standards, the intellectual standards of 2017 and look back on people like Jefferson Davis or Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, and apply today's reasoning. In other words, you have a duty to see the past only in terms of as they saw it. I mean, let's just assume for a second that could even be done, okay, first of all, okay? But what does that actually mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that you see a slaveholding society from the perspective of the slaveholders. I mean, who do you think was writing all of that stuff back then? It means that you take a look at Nazi Germany only from the perspective of the Nazis. Were any Jews in concentration camps writing extensive tomes? Why do you think Anne Frank's diary, for instance, is so important? Because it gives you a first-hand perspective of what it was like to live under Nazi occupation at the time. So, from my perspective, and I think from the perspective of others, it's perfectly fine, as long as you do it carefully, to uh, employ contemporary judgments looking back on the past, okay? But only if you do it very carefully. And the people who castigate people such as myself for being presentists 
do not deploy this logic when they talk about public housing. The original intent, the modernist intent of public housing, starting during the New Deal, is almost never discussed by new urbanists. And it's almost never discussed by neoliberals. It's a really glaring double standard. And I just wanted to bring to your attention because I think you'll be able to see as I unfold this discussion what I'm talking about. So let's get into briefly what some of the ph philosophies were behind public housing, okay? It's basically based on European social housing. In the interwar years between World War I and World War II, Europe constructed over 5 million units of public housing. Modern British council or social housing consisted of over 1.5 million units. And Denmark, Germany, elsewhere in Scandinavia, Austria, all over Europe. It makes sense. World War I devastated the European continent. There was a dramatic shortage of housing, and it was laughable to think that the private sector was going to build it. This then spurred modernist conceptions of how some of this housing could be built. And that's what led to, among other things, the Bauhaus, okay, Bauhaus architects. I'm sure most of you in here don't need me, do, do you need me to mention the Bauhaus? What the Bauhaus is? Gropiusstadt in Berlin is named for Walter Gropius, of course, who was one of the leaders of the Bauhaus, actually its chief founder, okay? And it's named in his honor. Gropius, of course, was an important German architect and planner who, uh, during the war, shortly thereafter, came to uh, the United States and worked at Harvard, um, along with Ernst May and other people, and built some stuff in the United States as well. But those are the origins of what would become known as the art moderne or international style. Okay? For instance, like this here. And notice its similarity to Austin's own Rosewood Courts. Okay? Now, one of the things that's important to understand about what this housing was, it was meant to be truly public housing in the sense that it relied upon public ownership of land. This is a key thing to understand. In Germany, and in, for instance, countries such as the Netherlands, what percentage do you think in those countries of housing is publicly owned or publicly subsidized? Anybody care to venture a guess? No, it's not that high. Anybody else? No, it's higher than that. It's ab in the Netherlands, it's about 40%. Now, what is the percentage of public housing in the United States? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Now, do you think that there's some sort of correlation here between affordability, livability, quality of life, uh, and that fact? Probably there is, okay? And that marks one of the big differences between uh, the public housing program as it's practiced today by housing authorities such as Austin's and the way housing is done elsewhere in the world. Hong Kong and Singapore have much higher rates of public housing, public housing high-rises that are much bigger than anything Cabrini Green ever was, okay? Now, the United States, as this came across the pond, took this on and really talked about it in terms of design, which is one of the points that I want to make about what happened to the international style in the United States. There was an exhibition at the newly established Museum of Modern Art in New York in the early 1930s called the International Style. It wasn't called that in Europe, but that's what uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson called it. You all know who these people are, right? Henry Ross, these guys, I, you know, Philip Johnson's that old dude with the big round glasses who built the glass house in Connecticut, right? Modernist icon. Wasn't really an architect per se, but he hung around with a lot of architects. New York was kind of like that, kind of bohemian, okay? But what they did is they really decided to focus more on the design aspects of what they termed the international style than its sociological or political dimensions.
which is what Gropius and others talked about, okay? So what you got consequently over time, I'm going to skip this, and you can read Gropius anytime besides translated into English, he sounds funny. What you got over time is stuff like this. You got buildings like this, Mies. You all know what this building is? Who knows what this one is? That is the Ferris Bueller house, where the car falls out the back. I'm glad, I'm glad some of you remembered that. That's right. That's correct. A modernist icon. Lots of glass houses, you know, bringing it out into the open. And that's Johnson's house in Connecticut. What about these? Those are in Austin, in Bolden Creek, in the Bolden Creek neighborhood. Okay? This grammar, this design grammar, has been absorbed into the American architecture profession now for many years. But its original expression and incarnation was in mass-produced social or public housing for the masses, not in glass houses for rich people who go to museums in New York. That's the point, okay? You have Mies and others who, of course, worked in Chicago, who designed a bunch of glassy-looking uh, office buildings all over the place. That's what it became under American capitalism. But what was lost over time was, again, this quasi-socialistic aspect. So Bob Dole and Jack Kemp were actually right when they called public housing socialism. That is what it is. What do you think healthcare, socialized healthcare is? It's socialism, that's exactly what it is, okay? Now let's briefly talk about the USHA, the United States Housing Authority created by the 1937 Housing Act. And this is a picture from uh, the Architectural Forum from 1938. And in there they introduced who the USHA personnel were. Do you all know a little bit about some of the public housing history of the United States? Briefly, in the early part of the New Deal, 1933-34, President Roosevelt was able to get established with Congress's help, the PWA, the Public Works Administration. There was an alphabet soup of all kinds of agencies at that time, NYA, PWA, WPA, you know, VCR, QED, you know. But you get the point. There was uh, a branch of the PWA which constructed some public housing, built about 25,000 units across the United States. And some of the more famous housing projects that it built were things such as Techwood in Atlanta, which is the nation's first federally funded public housing since demolished. Uh, the Carl Mackley houses in Philadelphia is another example. But that program was mainly experimental. It was an early attempt to implement European social housing concepts, modernist design on a larger scale in the United States. It wasn't until the passage of the 1937 United States Housing Act that for the first time you got public housing for real in the United States. But what was the USHA's purpose? The USHA could not directly build public housing the way its precursor program at the PWA could. That's because there was a lawsuit based in Kentucky that said that the federal government could not use its power of eminent domain. And what that Supreme Court decision established is that land use is a local matter, meaning city councils and other locally elected bodies are the uh, governmental bodies that have the power of eminent domain, not the federal government. Consequently, the United States Housing Authority, what it did is it provided funding, design advice, and more or less program guidance for what would become known as local housing authorities. There are thousands of these across the United States. The two largest housing authorities are, anybody know? in terms of units? New York, New York City. New York City is by far the largest local housing authority in America. Almost a quarter of all public housing in America is in New York City. What's the second largest one? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, of course, you know, that's a big open question, what's gonna happen to all of that public housing. 
But you're right about El Paso. El Paso has the largest housing authority in Texas. Uh, Houston and Dallas, smaller. Corpus Christi also had. Corpus is shrinking its public housing. Uh, every housing authority is doing that. Austin's housing authority was never big, although it was the first one under that law in the United States. Santa Rita Courts is the first public housing project constructed and occupied under the 1937 Housing Act. So that's one, and of course, we know the reason why, don't we? It's because of a young 28-year-old member of Congress who had just gotten elected in a special election, whose name was Lyndon Baines Johnson, okay? Who saw to it that his hometown, well, he's from Johnson City, but the, the, town, the biggest town in the district that he represented, the 10th Congressional District of Texas, got some funding, okay? So that's why Austin has that public housing. But as you can see, what was established, and this is Nathan Strauss, tell you a quick story about Nathan Strauss. Nathan Strauss was the administrator of the USHA. The Strauss name is a very important Jewish American family name. Uh, did you know that he went to college in Germany at the University of Heidelberg and his roommate at the University of Heidelberg in the 1920s was Otto Frank, who's the father of Anne Frank. Okay, it gets even more interesting. Uh, Strauss got a lot of people in Europe away from the Nazis, and Otto Frank desperately wrote his old college roommate to try to escape Nazi Germany. Uh, and Strauss had arranged for the Frank family, Otto and his two daughters uh, in particular, to come to Cuba, but for a variety of reasons, basically uh, red tape that had engulfed the Roosevelt administration after uh, Germany declared war on the United States kept it from happening. So unfortunately, Anne and her sister, you know, uh, died in a concentration camp. Otto Frank lived. Otto Frank went on to live, and he remarried, okay? But that's just one of the more interesting stories. I just thought I'd share that with you. I don't know. I just felt like it. I don't know if you found that interesting or not. Uh, then, of course, you have Catherine Bauer, author of Modern Housing. You all know who Catherine Bauer was? She is one of the founders of the planning profession in America. Did you know that? Are you being taught this here in this school? You should be. Catherine Bauer, you need to know who this woman is. You very much need to know who this woman is. One of the most important white women of the 20th American century. Let me break it down that way, okay? Very, very important. She wrote a book in 1934 called Modern Housing which was based upon her extensive travels throughout Europe where she examined what European countries were doing in terms of uh, mainly public housing construction, but not exclusively, okay? Her mentor was Lewis Mumford. You all know Lewis Mumford? The uh, writer, art critic, and other people, right? Uh, Lewis Mumford, tremendously important guy, okay? Uh, Co-founder of the Regional Planning Association of America. But you should read Modern Housing sometime because one of the things that you'll sort of glean is that new urbanism really isn't in conversation with much of what she wrote. But it uses a lot of declaratory sort of calumnies. Uh, it makes these sort of statements that are not sort of like the current Housing Authority mission statement <coughs> that really are empirically supportable. And then this is Robert C. Weaver. 30-year-old Negro, Harvard PhD, Robert C. Weaver, Special Assistant on Racial Relations. 30 years later, Mr. Weaver was appointed the first secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development by then President Johnson. Okay. Uh, Weaver is an interesting guy um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, the main building at HUD in Washington, D.C. is the Robert Weaver Building. If you, ever, if you guys ever get a chance to go to HUD, that's what it's called. And there's also a bust of Catherine Bauer in the building by Oscar Stoneroff. So, Austin's public housing. Here's some pictures. Who's that? That's Congressman Johnson. Okay? At the opening of Santa Rita Courts on September 2nd, 1939. I try to track this family down, these girls here, who would be in their 80s now. Okay? But I just, I just couldn't do it. I wrote the nomination to the National Register for the Santa Rita Courts Historic District 10 years ago uh, and just tried, like, like the, just couldn't do it, especially this little baby here, okay? 
Couldn't do it, much to my regret. Hopefully someday we'll find out who these little kids were. And then over here, this is the dedication of Rosewood Courts in March of 1939. Do you all, who are these people? That's Tom Miller, the longest serving mayor in the history of Austin, who was mayor at the time. That is Edgar Perry, Commodore Perry. You all know the Commodore Perry estate off of Red River there? That's getting ready to be uh, a uh, hotel. This is that Commodore Perry, a, co a cotton broker. He had a big cotton operation up in uh, Taylor, you know, right by the railroad. Had a lot of blacks and Mexicans pulling cotton, sharecroppers pulling cotton for him. And then this is, that's Nathan Strauss, the federal head of the United States Housing Authority, who came to Austin from Washington, D.C., and spoke before a special session of the Texas legislature to explain what this public housing pro uh, program was going to mean for places such as Texas, okay? So, and you can still see this plaque today, okay? It's still there. Now, the discourse of disaster I already mentioned to you before, but basically, when American pundits about public housing speak, what they usually talk about, and by the way, this book here, New Deal Ruins, I highly recommend that you read it. Published in 2012 uh, by Edward Goetz, who uh, was previously the dean of the Hubert Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and he examined hundreds of public housing demolitions and revitalizations, mainly under HUD's HOPE 6 program, the infamous HOPE 6 program, and found uh, some disturbing things. But the discourse of disaster basically is this HUD playbook over time used to generate intellectual justification for the demolition of public housing. It emphasizes how bad it is for families. It emphasizes that they are, and I'm speaking here primarily of housing projects such as Cabrini Green in Chicago since demolished, which has been turned into a hipster paradise with rents in excess of $2,500 a month. Okay. <clears throat> but these things are too dense. They are warehouses of crime. Okay? And it's misrepresented, worst of all, as an effort to help the public housing poor themselves. When in fact, the dismantlement of public housing is best understood in racial terms. Most public housing tenants by the late 1960s and early 1970s were African Americans. At the time of Cabrini Green's demolition, over 98% of public housing tenants in the city of Chicago were black. This was not by accident. Uh, those of you who've uh, probably heard of Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, talk about why some of that is. Okay? The political shift from a New Deal social welfare to neoliberal governing strategies and the economic revitalization of central cities that occurred after the 1991 recession. Those are the better lenses to understand why this was being done. I'll, I'll skip that. Basically, it just says that the failures of public housing really had nothing to do with design. Okay? It wasn't a failure of modernism, of modernist architecture. Public housing high-rises weren't necessarily a bad thing. Public housing high-rises are all over the world. There are public housing high-rises in New York City, <coughs> all across Asia. You can read about the dismantling of some of that nonsense in this book here, Public Housing Myths, which was published a couple of years ago, which definitively responds to this, this quackery that modernist architecture is responsible for uh, what happened with public housing. Basically, it's a star of the beast policy. It's sort of like Grover Norquist. Make it so bad, make it so uninhabitable that people are going to want to get rid of it. And it's, it's been a very successful strategy. It's a strategy that many people at the federal governmental level are now employing with education. Our current Secretary of Education is employing a similar strategy. Make public education so bad, defund it so much, that people just cannot, they can't deal with it anymore, okay? Matter of fact, these two things went hand in hand in New Orleans after Katrina. Not only after Katrina, was all of the public housing in New Orleans destroyed, what happened to the public education system? 
It was privatized, all of it. All of it was privatized. The entire education system of the city of New Orleans was charterized and privatized. Remarkable story. Those two things, in other words, went hand in hand. We now have over 10 years of data, at least on the educational side. Have educational outcomes in the city of New Orleans improved for those kids? What do you think? Yes or no? No, the answer is no. <laughs> no, they have not. Now, Jane Jacobs has talked about a lot. You all know who Jane Jacobs is, right? The death and life of American cities. Everybody knows Jane Jacobs, right? But, and this slide is titled, The Racism of New Urbanism for a Reason. What you normally don't hear much is that Lewis Mumford wrote a review of that book in 1962. You don't hear it quoted often. Why? Well, because he had some things to say about it that have, I think, been shown to be basically to be the case. Jane Jacobs was a white woman from Scranton, Pennsylvania. She's not from Greenwich Village, and she's not from Toronto. New urbanism, to the extent that it claims descent from Jane Jacobs, has inherited some of those racial biases that characterize what Jane Jacobs was saying in her criticism of urban America in the early 1960s. Mumford basically said that her obsession, her preoccupation with the street and the prevention of crime is something that is fundamentally unurban. And then he kind of gets a little bit New Yorkish on her. He says, let me tell you something about the fact, I mean, Lewis Mumford is a died in the wool New Yorker. He, over the course of his long life, observed every single change in New York City in the modern era. He, for instance, was alive when New York consolidated in 1897, when the boroughs got together. Mumford was born in 1895 and died in 1990. He saw the first skyscrapers being built in New York. He remembers the old New York when it was just low-rise brownstone walk-ups, two and three stories. Okay. So he kind of reminds Jane Jacobs of this and says, as, as one who has spent more than 50 years in New York, speaking to a native of Scranton who has not, I must remind Mrs. Jacobs that many parts of the city she denounces because they do not conform to her peculiar standards were for over the better part of a century both economically quite sound and humanly secure. This Bottom paragraph, I think, gets really to the meat of the matter. New urbanists and Jane Jacobs acolytes don't really have an explanation for American racism to the extent that it intertwines with real estate. They don't talk about the fact that public housing was segregated. They don't talk about racism in the FHA and the VA. These are things that have now been increasingly discussed by people such as ta Coates, in his writings in The Atlantic, you hear Richard Florida's City Lab talk about it from time to time. But you cannot fundamentally understand urban dynamics and that it was de jure segregation that caused many of the urban ills. And this notion, that design, in other words, new urbanist dogma, you know, we have to make urban America more walkable and livable and safe, has to look like Seaside, Florida. You know, the Robert Mueller development. You know, Austin's new urbanist showpiece. Let's take a look at that from a racial lens. How many black people live at Mueller? How many black lower class people now live there? Anybody know? You all familiar with the Robert Mueller development? That used to be Austin's airport, right? And the firm that the city of Austin engaged to help it revitalize that area was a San Francisco-based firm called Catalis. Of course, San Francisco is also the home of the Congress for the New Urbanism. So if you're wondering why Austin has become increasingly more like San Francisco, it's because those are decisions that were made by our elected officials. It didn't happen by accident, okay? And yes, there was a tremendous amount of ethnic cleansing at the Robert Mueller area, okay? That, I mean, some of the first housing that was built there was million-dollar housing. At the time 
it was said that we needed to have what they called an equity sharing agreement. Do you all know what that is? Yeah, all among other things. But equity sharing is kind of, you know, the Texas translation of that is big dogs got to eat first. We got to build a bunch of million dollar houses. But some of that money we're going to recapture so that we can build some of that quote unquote affordable housing. You don't hear that phrase equity sharing that Mueller talked about anymore because that has been a miserable failure. What they're now doing to build affordable housing there is using conventional low income housing tax credits to build some of that stuff there. Okay. Uh, I could go on and on and on about what, in terms of equity, the Robert Mueller development means. But what I'm trying to get at here is, is that it shouldn't be a surprise that there has been a tremendous amount of race and class cleansing at a place like that when the decisions that we've made are based on that. Okay? Right. There you go. You got it. Mueller, the negotiations about what to do there entailed several neighborhood association discussions. The airport itself fell into a neighborhood planning area. Remember, Austin, in terms of its neighborhood planning, has contact teams. Um, and there were contact teams in that area that the city consulted with and brought on board, who eventually endorsed what took place. Okay. Uh, but, and Susanna can speak to this, I think, even better than I could. But a lot of the people who were doing the consulting with the city's consultants, with Catalis in particular, were not, peop were not poor people of color. Okay? They were people, some of whom were UT graduate students, okay, who, uh, who were negotiating with the city about what should take place there. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. That, that was definitely a big factor there. Now, a lot of people call new urbanism a cult. I would have to say, based upon my experience at public housing projects, I would say that's true. The discussions uh, in Austin about what to do with Code Next are really a further indicator of the degree to which these people talk about density, for instance. Let's just talk about that notion of density. What does density mean? Well, it has a, de it has a definition in physics. Density equals mass over volume. Okay, That's its definition in physics. What does it mean in terms of urban planning? New urbanists love density. They love transit-oriented development, all these different zoning schemes. What does it mean in practice? Population okay. Like, for instance, transit-oriented development, Todd zoning. We now have Plaza Saltillo, a showpiece property owned by Capital Metro. Although I'm not so sure because the city is doing whatever, you know, whatever it wants to, okay? What is the basis behind Todd zoning, transit-oriented development? What is, that, what is that all about? More square footage closer to the center. There you go. You know, a new urbanist principle, although not exclusively, of this notion that we ought to be able to live, work, and play right where we are. And we ought to be close to public transit. Okay, How has Austin's implementation of that gone over the years? Not that well. Europe's implementation of it, of course, is much better. And a lot of people who argued for transit-oriented development in Austin and in other cities look to the European example. Paris, for instance, is a good example. If you want to go from Paris to the suburbs, there's a train that will take you there. Okay, And there's stuff right next to the train station. You can't do that in Austin, Texas. We don't have the transportation infrastructure. But we want to be dense, which gets to my point. Density discussions in Austin, Texas aren't really about transportation and the principles behind transit-oriented development at all. They are about profits. They are about real estate speculation. In theory, you really ought to have the transportation infrastructure in place first before you can have a realistic discussion about uprooting entire neighborhoods. Also, from, uh, for these new urbanists, this discussion about density has been, I think, very passive-aggressive. In my 20 plus years of work in public housing projects, I have had to listen to new urbanist after new urbanist talk about how public housing is too dense, how they are breeding grounds for crime. In other words, when it's black people, you can't have too many black people in one place. They get too dense. 
Look at Cabrini Green. Look at some of these other housing projects. They live, they're just in too close of proximity to each other. Look what happens. Okay, so when it's public housing, density is bad. All right? But when it's out in the street for white people, then it's like, oh, we must have more density. Density is good. You can't have it both ways. Okay? If you think density is a valid principle, a valid pl planning principle, then you have to have a consistent theory behind it. I think New Urbanism is really best understood as a political movement more than anything related to design or planning. That makes sense. It coalesced around the presidency of Bill Clinton uh, starting in 1993. The Congress for the New Urbanism got together around that time. Uh, and people such as Mr. Calthorpe, Peter Calthorpe and others uh, quickly narrowed in on public housing as a place for them to really implement some of their conceptions of what urban America ought to look like. So what you really have now is, is that new urbanists, in this book right here, Principles for Inner City Neighborhood Design, this is a publication that the Congress for the New Urbanism put out in the late 1990s, commissioned by HUD about some basic planning principles. They actually put together a quote unquote inner city task force. There was an inner city task force of the Congress for the New Urbanism. Do you think there were any actual public housing residents on that inner city task force? No, there weren't any, okay? But they made some recommendations of what to do with public housing, okay? Compare that, by the way, with the early 1990s task force convened by HUD about what to do with public housing sites, which did have public housing tenants on it. It also had Richard Barron on it of McCormick, Barron, and Salazar, one of the big firms that demolishes public housing projects around the country and has been engaged by the Austin Housing Authority to demolish Rosewood Courts. Uh, Mr. Barron was a legal aid attorney in the early 1970s but caught new urbanist religion and is now one of the biggest public housing demolishers of all time. Uh, but basically, uh, they have a very narrow conception about how to revitalize public housing so narrow, in fact, that they kind of are like American soldiers in Vietnam. In order to save this village, we had to destroy it. And that's basically what they're doing at public housing sites. In order to save public housing, we have to demolish it. Now, what about black people? Did black people have opinions about what was happening in urban America, even in the 1960s during the Civil Rights era? Of course we did. Who is this? That's Whitney Young, one of the big six, right? You know who these are? Who are, the, who are the big six? These are the African American civil rights icons, right? Whitney Young, Martin Luther King, A. Philip Randolph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Who are looked at as the leading figures of the civil rights movement at that time. Whitney Young. The Urban League, one of the more conservative African-American uh, civil rights organizations. But to make a long story short, Whitney Young gave the keynote address at the 1968 AIA convention, where he castigated the architectural profession. And you saw some of the things that he said in that address. One of the consequences that came out of that address is the establishment of the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA. You all know about NOMA, right? So Mr. Young said some things about the profession of architecture that I think you don't hear talked about much. And they kind of piggy piggyback nicely on some of the things that Lewis Mumford said about Jane Jacobs when he reviewed her book in 1962. How is it that architects would design public housing high rises where elevators skip floors where there are no bathrooms in some of the units, and where the basements have labyrinthine little hallways with only one exit. This was not housing for families by that point, at all. Okay, I mean, the housing that I referred to earlier, the public housing that was built in the first generation of public housing, the, the New Deal housing, that was, of course, housing built for families. But by the 1960s, what were we building? Those stereo even really the late 50s, those stereotypical public housing high-rises that Jane Jacob castigates in her book, okay, 
Whitney Young gave a per African American perspective, but it was one where he castigated the architectural profession. How could you, as an architect, design garbage like this? Under some theory that, well, it's just my job to give my client what he wants. Really? That's your job to give your client what he wants? You're going to build some garbage like that? Where's your sense of professional ethics? Never mind human decency. Okay? That was an important statement to make. Now, I am saddened, unfortunately, that NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, has not been a friend to public housing either. Matter of fact, some of the worst implementers of the destruction of African American housing for the poor have been African American middle class architects and planners. That's the case in Atlanta, Houston, Washington, D.C., Boston, and here in Austin, Texas. But that's a different story. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about what planning schools and architecture schools have done to assist in this nonsense. After Hurricane Katrina, you had the MIT Department of Architecture and Planning come down in force to New Orleans and seize what was at the time called uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity to remake New Orleans. And they were going to remake New Orleans in their new urbanist image. But that meant getting rid of the black people who lived where? In public housing. Now, New Orleans is one of the original three housing authorities. The original three housing authorities were Austin, New Orleans, and New York. So New Orleans' public housing is like Austin's. It was built to last, made of brick. It flooded out during the hurricane. Actually, not during the hurricane. It flooded out because of the levee breaking. Okay. But eventually the water receded and you could scrub it back. And it was agreed that those units would be habitable once more. But that is not what the New Orleans City Council under leadership of Mayor Ray Nagin would permit, nor the New Orleans Housing Authority. People who were ev evacuated from New Orleans could not go back to their public housing units. They were forbidden from doing so. And eventually Lafitte, the housing project that I showed you earlier, would be demolished with the assistance of planning programs, planners and architects from a variety of Boston-based firms and schools and universities of architecture. It is this template that the University of Texas School of Architecture followed when it decided to partner with the Austin Housing Authority to demolish Rosa Courts. The single biggest contributor of in-kind services to the effort by any nonprofit or educational institution, and the Housing Authority had put together a proposal that had the signature of just about every elected official in this town uh, of goodwill, safe play, I mean, you name it, you name a nonprofit, they had co endorsement. But it was the University of Texas School of Architecture that agreed to teach graduate seminars in this subject where graduate students would. Uh, would work in uh, demolishing Rosewood Courts, revitalizing Rosewood Courts. You had a professor uh, in community and regional planning who specializes in community engagement and community outreach, who uh, taught a class, did a project uh, where some of her students would talk to some of the public housing residents. Yeah, this enriches a lot of people. So, the path forward. The talk says that I would analyze the landscape going forward. So let me end by saying this. The path forward is a rejection of neoliberalism. This is from this morning's London Independent. Jeremy Corbyn was just in Brussels where he received a standing ovation speaking to Europe's uh, center and center left parties basically saying that the path forward is not neoliberalism anymore. Neoliberalism as an economic and philosophical ideology is over. It's dead. Even its proponents, the ones who are intelligent and reasonable, know that the intellectual case for neoliberalism is over. It produces, it reproduces inequality by design. Even 
organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, as well as certain branches of the Fed in the United States, have published analyses that neoliberalism, by design, reproduces inequality. So the intellectual case for neoliberalism, I think, is over. What this is about is about power, money, politics, political interest. And in cities like Austin, Texas, that's where we are right now with this discussion about Code Next. You all know about the Code Next discussion? What do you all know about that? A little bit? OK, well, I'm going to end my talk. And hopefully, we can have some robust dialogue about it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Let's hit it. Come on. Mm -hmm. which I think has happened in England also. Yeah. With the Grenfell Tower disaster. Oh, yeah, that. The conservative government has recently kind of gone back on a commitment that they made to fund um, fire sprinklers in all public housing towers. Now they're saying they're not going to do that, even though so many people died in the Grenfell disaster. Yeah. Oh, no, you're right. And that's only going to get worse, so what is the path forward for a small housing authority in terms of getting the funding they need for Well, we have, of course, HUD, you know, the biggest thing that HUD is pushing now and that Secretary Carson loves, it's really the only thing he understands about public housing, it seems, is RAD, the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. Okay? That's something that NYCHA, NYCHA, by the way, is New York City Housing Authority, that's something that NYCHA also is embracing. The de Blasio administration is relying on NYCHA extensively, uh, as is our housing authority. Matter of fact, Austin's housing authority will employ RAD at every single public housing site. This is what they want to do at Chalmers Courts. Okay? So uh, in New York's case, what they want to do, they're not necessarily going to demolish some of their public housing. The RAD program privatizes the public housing and turns it into Section 8 vouchers. And they will, it also permits construction in current open space at those public housing projects, which the housing authority then will use to generate funding to perform long deferred maintenance on its original public housing stock. This is not being received well in New York. Uh, Tom Angotti of the Hunter College uh, uh, School of Public Affairs, uh, I think, what was his term? Public housing privatization and marketization is what he calls it. Okay? And yes, there are, and I, I completely agree with Mr. Angotti. I think public housing plays an important role in real estate. And the United States already has such a small percentage of housing in the public sector that this really is an encroachment that marks the beginning of the end for any sort of realistic notion of public housing in the American political economy. In the UK, I think Mr. Corbyn will be prime minister within two years. Uh, and we know what he stands for. There's a reason he got a, uh, a standing ovation in Brussels. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party in the United States has a choice to make. It's really that simple. And I'm speaking here primarily you know, in, in Democratic Party terms. Do you want to embrace those neoliberal Clint, you know, Clintonistic policies, or are you prepared to go back to your roots? Are you going to be liberal or neoliberal, is really what it boils down to. Uh, Corbyn, unlike Bernie Sanders, was able to be successful for a range of structural reasons and others. Um, and let, let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens here. I think. If I was a public housing administrator, if I was Mr. Gerber, for instance, here in Austin, uh, 
I would continue to hold the line. I would continue to hold, you know, to, uh, I mean, this housing authority owns real estate besides its public housing portfolio. Lakeside downtown, the public housing senior citizen high rise is worth tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars. The Austin Housing Authority owns shopping malls. It has, re it has sources of revenue besides rents, okay? And there's also the question of our city council appropriating money for public housing conservation and preservation. In New York, that does happen at a, on a scale that, you know, Austin can't even imagine. I mean, Austin is a tiny city compared to New York City. Uh, but those are some things that I think, you know, and that's the, the creation of a housing stabilization fund, an affordable housing fund, is something that was a recommendation of the institutional, ta the institutional racism task force that the mayor put together in Austin. That was one of their primary recommendations. So it's going to take money. But for anything that's valuable, people tax themselves. It's really that simple. Notice, what, I mean, that sounds kind of radical today in 2017, but that's not what it traditionally has been understood as being. In uh, the 1930s, in the advent of during the New Deal, and then when we had World War II, President Roosevelt said, you guys, you know, the American people are going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to sell war bonds, and tax rates will have to increase. Compare that with 2001, 2002, and the lead up to the invasion of Iraq where President Bush cut taxes and told people to go shopping. I mean, those are the choices. Those are the political choices. That's what it's about. We can continue in America to permit the uh, continuing encroachment on our public services, on our public sector, by wealth extractors. Not wealth creators, wealth extractors. That's what American capitalism is now. Okay? Or we can stand up, like they are in the UK. That's it. I thought I had more time. Uh huh. Ah. Well, I have to come clean. Uh, Code Next is not fixable. And no amount of community engagement can fix it. Code Next is an example of cynical overreach by Austin's real estate overlords to foist garbage on the citizens of Austin. And using and to use flowery, neoliberal, new urbanist feel-good rhetoric to do it. Okay, neoliberalism is very good at using non-profity language. Okay, the most important tool that neoliberals use is the non-profit, charity, deserving charity, charity for the deserving poor. Who could be against that? What you're not supposed to look at is power, money, information asymmetry, interest, follow the money. Okay. That would be what I would say to that. 
Uh, also, Austin's community engagement practices. I'm not a believer in community engagement. I mean, I have a much more, I think, progressive, even radical notion of what that is supposed to mean. I believe in, t in terms of planning <coughs> that you should have a say to the degree that you're impacted by what is being proposed. That seems like a pretty simple principle. It's a principle that rich people apply to themselves. They don't apply it to poor people, though. Public housing is a perfect example of that. Poor people are too stupid. They don't have the education. They don't have the resources to understand these wonderful grand abstractions that we learned in graduate school. Therefore, we must do it for them. Community engagement in practice means that we just want their signature on a piece of paper to say that we, quote unquote, consulted them. That's it. That's all it ever means. Okay. Compare how planning happens between a city like Austin or New York and Seattle. Seattle is by no means a utopia. It is also gentrifying tons and tons of problems. But Seattle does have a department of neighborhoods. And neighborhood organizations in Seattle have the ability to overrule City Hall. In other words, bona fide neighborhood associations in that city can say no. And there isn't a thing the city council can do about it. Matter of fact, the Department of Neighborhoods not only does historic preservation for the city of Seattle, it oversees a fund whereby neighborhood associations can hire their own planners at taxpayer expense to plan their neighborhoods and to fact check everything that comes out of the mouth of a city bureaucrat. It's a question of accountability. If I get to hire, like, do I want to have a lawyer who's being paid for by somebody else? Do I want a planner who's working for City Hall and not for me? It's just, I mean, it's just common sense, right? Austin's neighborhood plans were, were are a creation of, of City Hall. Neighborhood planning contact teams are a creation of City Hall. That's why there are rich neighborhoods in Austin, such as Pemberton Heights, that don't even have a contact team. They're like, why do we need a contact team? It's a waste of our time. Most people can call the mayor and just say, this is not happening. I mean, city planners don't even bother to try to cram unwanted development down the throat of that neighborhood. In Old Enfield or, or Pemberton, it's just not going to happen. Where it is happening is in our community of Montopolis, where developers don't even bother to come to our contact team half the time. <laughs> They just are like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And the city, city hall has already blessed it. What do you say? We have to talk to you. That's why we're here. <laughs> That's the attitude that we get there. And Code Next would just double and triple down on that process. I could go on and on. I mean, for instance, I'm not a big believer in form-based codes. Form-based codes are just one of the most awful examples of new urbanist hubris you could possibly imagine. What, what, what is a form-based code, if you think about it for a second? What does that even mean? The traditional definition of density and planning, to bring it back to something we talked about earlier, is number of families per acre. That's the traditional definition of density and planning. That was its definition when public housing projects were first being planned in the 1930s. That is a definition that goes back to the late 19th century. It was employed by Ebenezer Howard, Patrick Geddes, some of the founders of the profession of planning. And that's what gets us to things such as SF zoning, single family zoning, MF, multifamily zoning. It relies on a conception in urban areas of what you believe to be the organizing unit of humanity in an urban space. And Geddes and Howard and others believed it was the family. Now, we could debate that sociologically and anthropologically. Is the family unit actually the best unit to use to organize how we want to use space in an urban area? But it's what people came up with. So that's why Austin's code has things such as SF1, SF2, SF3, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Replacing that with a form-based code, it removes those valuations from it. It focuses purely on form. Right? In other words, a box, a three-dimensional thing. Okay? That is a very neoliberal and peculiar conception of how land is used. It's very unanthropological and unsociological. 
as human beings, we ascribe value to the use of our natural resources. Not just land, but water, air, and other things. And, that's, and by stipulating that the family is the basic unit of planning, we are making an important value judgment that form-based codes completely remove. So anyway, I could go on forever about that, but. Well, I, I really um, hate to do this, but I have to do this right off of the conversation. Uh, just a kind of a concluding comment uh, or remark over here. Uh, in foreign, uh, we have this platform for dialogue. We welcome and encourage uh, people talking about uh, different issues, touching issues, Touching issues, hot topics uh, from different perspectives. Also, uh, we hope that the City Forum provides opportunity for us during school to expand our learning grounds. So we learn from beyond the textbooks. And back to I noticed that the, the talk by uh, Dr. McGee that we hear. Uh, Examples maybe coming from uh, the first generation of um, Malinism uh, or Hagrokus uh, or uh, uh, other uh, Miss Van Roo or the Bill, this uh, group of people. Maybe anybody ever call the second generation of others or <laughs> maybe uh, Andre Tiwani, the Papas, and so forth, and those you know, the, the architects thinking about their design, their buildings, when they go beyond the physical aspect, that's where lots of concerns and challenges uh, occur. And the, um, it's not the physical aspect, but the social, environmental, other dimensions. Uh, and, and then we have public officials, and then the neighborhood or uh, urban activists or speakers that reminds me of a question I will always ask. What is the role of planning? What is the role of planning? What we can do? Trying to bridge the gaps. That's, uh, I think that, uh, I hope uh, people come over here, listen to our speakers, not necessarily uh, looking for answers, solutions, but different way of thinking about issues that we are dealing with. Daily life, or we will be dealing with as professions. So, uh, with that, I'll conclude our uh, forum. Uh, thanks again to Dr. McGee. Thank you. I'll stick around if you want to talk some more.